Hello, everyone, and welcome to the monthly, more or less, uh, Philosophy Book Club, which is co-hosted by yours truly, Massimo Pellucci, City University of New York, and Jamie Lombardi, uh, Bragging Community College. Hi, Jamie. How are you? I am all right, Massimo. How about yourself? <laughs> These days, I think, all right, <laughs> actually, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> I mean, we all thought that 2020 finally was over and 21 was going to be better. It didn't start exactly with the best, um, you know, in the best possible way. But we'll see. I think it's going to get better. I'm, I'm an optimist in this, in this respect. <laughs> all right. Before we get to today's topic and guest, uh, let me announce the next one. The next edition of the Philosophy Book Club will take place on Sunday, February 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, sad Sundays and 1 p.m. Eastern are our standard uh, fare, and it's going to be February 28th, as I said. We will discuss Grandstanding, the Use and Abuse of Moral Talk by Justin Tozzi and Brendan Wormke. If you want to register for that, you can go to meetup.com and look for Philosophy Book Club. And if you wish to watch past episodes of the Philosophy Book Club with Jamie and, and me, you can go to the uh, YouTube channel, to uh, YouTube, look for my channel, and then look for the Philosophy Book Club playlist. All right, today's topic is How Male Privilege Hurts Women by Kate Mann. Kate, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Absolutely, it's a ple it is a pleasure to be there to, to be here with you. <laughs> Sorry, um, you are you are up um, at Ithaca College. You said, uh, yes, um, I work at Cornell, uh, mm -hmm. and um, I uh, am in Ithaca. Yeah, and now you are you made a splash recently, like what was it a couple of years ago with Down Girl? Your was that your first book? Yes. Yes, right. And, and then now we're discussing uh, uh, your second one, um, which is about entitlement, as, as we'll say, we'll see in a minute what, what it is about. In fact, why don't we start with that? Could you sort of give us a brief overview of what, what is your thesis? What, what is it you're talking about in this book? And then Jamie and I will start pestering with questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to questions, both from you and Jamie and, and from um, those in attendance. Thanks everyone so much for being here. Um, so my first book, Down Girl, proposed a definition of misogyny, and I proposed that misogyny is metaphorically the law enforcement branch of patriarchy. It polices and enforces a patriarchal order by visiting women and girls with hostility and hatred um, paradigmatically when they don't play their um, assigned role in patriarchy when they don't meet with gendered norms and expectations. And so that left me with this question that I've been kind of wrestling with ever since, what are the gendered norms and expectations that are operative in um, say the US today in particular, as well as um, my home country of Australia, places like the UK, places where I, I view myself as a kind of cultural insider and interestingly, places that are often alleged to be post-patriarchal. So my answer, in effect, to that question is contained in this second book entitled, where I hold that women are punished and policed in as much as they don't, um, they don't conform to expectations and norms that say that they should um, obey the sense of entitlement that is prevalent in society, where men are deemed entitled to feminine uh, to uh, feminine coded goods like love, care, sex, um, and also things like power and claims to knowledge. Um, whereas I also argue in this book that women are often deprived of things that they're genuinely entitled to, things like health care, um, equal, uh, uh, participation um, of men in their households if they're in heterosexual relationships, um, and that particularly affects women of color, trans women, um, disabled women, queer women, and so on. So that's the basic point of this book, is to try to flesh out what uh, the gendered norms and expectations are, um, and to give a sense of the various modes of entitlement that I think women are beholden to. Right. Thank you. Well, so uh, 
I'm going to actually jump right at the end of the book. Um, no, no, no spoilers anyway. It's, it's, not a, it's not a novel. And what you do is that you, you conclude uh, the book by admitting that um, your previous one, Down Girl, as we mentioned, ended with a note of pessimistic resignation, as you, as you, as you say. And now you try to correct that a little bit at the end of Entitled, but in my, my perception, at least, not by much. You're still very pessimistic about this, the, the, whole, mm -hmm. the whole idea. So, so then there are two points that I, I'd like you to comment in this respect with that kind of background. First of all, what, what actions should, you, should we undertake? Should we uh, you know, follow, follow up on? Because as you know, Marx famously said, the point of philosophy is actually to change the world, right? Not just to talk about it. So, so if you actually were to uh, suggest some kind of steps uh, that we all should take, uh, what would those be? And also, I'd like you to comment on the possibility that there is perhaps too much pessimism in, in your book. Uh, while I'm on board with, essentially with pretty much everything you say in, in that book, the situation is still pretty dire. It's also, I think, historically true, however, that the situation for women in a number of respects has improved over the last, let's say, a century, right? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, absolutely. I'm, right. So I have, a, I have a daughter who is now uh, 23, and frankly, I'm very happy that she's living in this particular time, despite all the, you know, mess that is going on right now and all, et cetera, et cetera. Still, had she been born 30 or 40 years earlier or 100 years earlier and forget about earlier than that, um, her life would have been, as a woman, would have been much more difficult. Now, that doesn't mean that we're ne anywhere near where we should be. Um, that, that's for sure. But I kind of I'm afraid that not acknowledging that fact that uh, really does lead to pessimism, right? To to sort of despair. To like, okay, well, we're not, we're never going to get where we want to be, and we're not, we're not making progress. I don't know whether we're going to get where we want to be, but we certainly have been making progress. So, um, so what what do you think about these two points? Yeah. So in a way, the premise of my books is that we've made a lot of progress, mm -hmm. but that progress is not monolithic, and that what I'm we have to be careful to specify the content of my pessimism. And what my pessimism is really about is um, the idea that we'll be able to make much needed egalitarian and feminist social progress, as well as anti-racist social progress and so on, without incurring ugly, toxic backlash. So, I mean, it's important to not think of progress as linear but rather to think of it not just as incremental, but as Tressie McMillan Cotton puts it, a kind of do -si do dance between progress and severe forms of backlash that are simultaneous to the progress. And in fact, I think a direct result of it. Um, so it's undoubtedly true that we've made enormous feminist social progress as I emphasize in various places. Um, but because of that, precisely because of that, women and girls often pay a hefty toll for that progress in ways that can be very damaging and sometimes even tragic, particularly for the least privileged women who I'm especially concerned about here. Um, I mean, I write this book as someone who I, I think of myself as immensely privileged as well as immensely lucky and as privileged along every dimension bar gender. And because of that, I think I've been insulated in many ways from the kinds of, um, particularly pernicious forms of misogyny that many more vulnerable women are facing and that I think we need to fight against. Um, so that's, that's one response to the, the second point you make, um, to think about progress and backlash in a little bit more of a nuanced way is kind of what I'm, I'm advocating here. Um, I'd also say in response to the, um, the difference between the conclusions of my book um, and the um, common and I think understandable criticism that I'm too pessimistic. I mean, part of what I was doing in the first book was subversive. You know, there was, there's an expectation when you write a book about misogyny that you'll end with a note of optimism mm -hmm. and, you know, and hope and, um, you know, uh, thoughts about progress for the future. And I really wanted in a way to resist what I think of as yet another feminine coded expectation and obligation to give hope and light and say something kind of uplifting at the end. Uh, so part of what I'm doing is um, an act of um, 
if you like, philosophical subversion of saying, no, if you've read this book and as I, um, for me as someone who's written the book, um, this looks pretty bad when it comes to the um, possibility of avoiding toxic backlash. Um, I'm not optimistic about that. And the second book ended with a kind of different note, not so much because I'm more optimistic now. In fact, I, I think I say explicitly, it's not more optimism that's changed. It's that I think for largely personal reasons, I what changed was I became less resigned about this and more committed to the fight against this um, various forms of misogyny and toxic backlash for the simple reason that um, you know I wrote the book while pregnant with my uh, first child, my daughter, and I felt this renewed sense of commitment to be in the fight for her, even if it seems hopeless. Um, so I hope that gives a bit of a sense of why I, I really insist upon if you like an entitlement for people in general and women in particular to be somewhat pessimistic about um, specific things that that don't look um, liable to to change anytime soon like backlash um, and why I also there is this different tone in the second book's conclusion largely because I could see the fight more clearly and I knew I had to be in it that makes that makes sense to me, uh, Jimmy. Yeah, so I'm going to disagree with Massimo a little bit. Um, I'm very pe pessimistic um, about this as a woman who has to navigate a man's world. Um, but there are times, both in reading this book and Down Girl, that I had to put it down and step away and cry um, because it was just so accurately capturing my lived experience and parts of my lived experience that are just sort of taken for granted and considered morally neutral in ways that on the receiving end of them very much are not. Um, and I think one thing that might be helpful is to maybe help us understand the differences in how these things play out in more everyday, seemingly benign mm -hmm. scenarios than as the way that it's laid out in Entitled, you point to um, the incidents with Brett Kavanaugh as an example of someone feeling righteously aggrieved when their pursuit of power is threatened. You reference um, Brock Turner's father, for example, um, shocked that his you know, golden boy son might lose his position in the world as a result of violently raping an unconscious woman. Um, and these are obviously the most egregious examples of male entitlement, but there are also so many more that are just baked in that we don't realize. Um, and I was wondering if maybe um, you could give us some advice along the lines of what Maskimo was asking about what we can do, because I think for the most part, even men who consider themselves feminist or progressive aren't aware of the way they sort of slip into this behavior. Um, like I'll, I'll never forget, I was at a Save the Post Office rally back when that was a thing um, in one of the many attempts leading up to this, you know, coup or whatever is going on in this country. Um, and I was standing next to a man and, and um, someone who had run for office and part of her campaign was that she was a neuroscientist. And this man had worked on her campaign, was familiar with who she was and her background. And just in talking, somehow lead poisoning came up and he started to explain to the neuroscientist how damaging the effects of lead poisoning were on brains and how long-term they were. And I was just shocked because here is someone who clearly held her in high esteem, had worked for her campaign, and yet could not refrain from positioning himself as the knower in the conversation to explain the long-term effects of lead poisoning to a neuroscientist. It was, it was shocking to me. So what are some ways maybe we can become more aware of how insidious and invisible this is in our normal everyday interactions. Yeah, I love that question. And I love that set of observations, Jamie, because I mean, one way of looking at it um, would be the pessimism here is taking hope away from people. Um, I have an alternative framing, which is it's giving girls and women in particular permission to really 
feel the full brunt, the weight of having to battle against gendered norms and expectations that can be silencing and suffocating. Um, and so my hope is that if you frame it, this, these books as a, um, a small contribution to a conversation that centers girls and women, that um, they're offering something in the way of, of helping perhaps to um, unify certain experiences that for me at least seemed disparate until I had a kind of feminist consciousness raising thanks to the scholarship of you know, uh, too many brilliant feminist authors to name. Um, but yeah, I think I'm really interested in tracing, in sort of using vivid examples and extreme cases to help suggest a continuity between those and the more everyday forms of male entitlement, particularly white male entitlement that are so damaging. Um, and I think mansplaining is a prime example of the kind of thing that is, you know, it, it might seem um, to an outward uh, uh, observer like an isolated incident, but it's, it's really not. It's something that I think most women are highly familiar with and which is very much an everyday occurrence and is really undermining of one's position as an authority figure, as someone who does know things and can offer your, the information, the explanations that are foisted on you without, if you like, your consent or your, um, your interest or participation. Um, so that's one, I think, great example of the kinds of um, more everyday cases that crop up in this book. Um, you know, another really ubiquitous and highly pernicious but insidious form of um, uh, a, woman, a woman's lack of entitlement is in the medical care system, uh, the healthcare system. Um, so a lack of attention to women's pain and suffering, a lack of belief in her testimony um, about her own bodily experience, and this is particularly the case for black women in the US, um, you know, again, they might seem like small things on the face of it, but they have grave consequences, um, including being um, highly connected to Black women having um, three to four times the maternal mortality rate compared to white women in the US, which is just a disgrace and a shameful thing. Um, and in terms of what to do about it, and that was also something Massimo uh, asked about, um, you know, I'm really a proponent here of um, early education. So I think we need to teach uh, boys that they're not entitled to more than girls um, or, or uh, non-binary kids also. And to really have, I mean, if we had a more comprehensive, not just sex, but social education that emphasize um, the fact that gendered as well as uh, race social relations can be highly toxic and problematic. You know, I think that would be a great start um, to what will doubtless be a kind of piecemeal and patchy, necessarily patchy effort to dismantle all these systems that are so entrenched. But I think um, early education and not indulging a kind of boys will be boys mentality, um, that would be an excellent start um, to the process of undoing some of these um, highly pernicious, entrenched, and as you say, Jamie, everyday forms of male entitlement. Um, I have a, we have a question from Sky, who is our um, uh, occasional co-host. <laughs> Sky is, uh, is talking to us from uh, Australia at the moment. So go, go for it. You had a follow-up question, right, Sky? Well, thanks, Massimo. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I really appreciated the last chapter of your book where you were talking about how you're bringing up your um, uh, baby girl. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, education, like transforming early education and, uh, you know, later education too is, is going to be vital. And I was reading something Simone de Beauvoir wrote recently in that it's, you know, her suggestion was we need to all develop, you know, an anti-sexist reflex almost. Mm. And you know, it's fine if you, you know, have these automatic biases or um, whatever that you're thinking, but it's, you know, making sure that you constantly, um, you know, act in ways that are um, 
you know, challenging that. And I was just watching an Adam Sandler movie, I've got a 10 year old boy. And so I was mm-hmm. thinking, oh, well, how do I bring him up to be sensitive to this? And this, there was this 2005 Adam Sandler movie. And you know, literally every 10 minutes, there was something like horribly sexist. And so I had, so <laughs> every time I was like pausing it and saying, this is what's wrong with this. And it's kind of exhausting. It's everywhere. It's on TikTok. It's, um, you know, I, like looking over his shoulder occasionally like like trying to stop and say hey you know what's wrong with this and it's just you know sometimes it feels really overwhelming um and so it's just you know I appreciate what you were saying like in down girl how you're so pessimistic but it's um you know I guess I'm kind of looking wondering about you know more practical ways for for bringing up boys like what what can we do to start start now Yeah, no, that's a great question and observation. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that your um, comment brings out is just the ubiquity in pop culture of, um, you know, so many, so many ways in which um, a sense of especially white male entitlement is perpetuated. And it is exhausting to have to combat it uh, constantly. you know, it's also something where I think there has been an understandable feminist focus on on pornography, which I think can be very damaging, um, you know, in its, uh, especially in violent forms um, for, uh, you know, especially boys and uh, men. But it's, it's so much broader than that. Um, and, you know, I, I think your approach, exhausting though, I'm sure it is, has a lot to be said for it, of not trying to, um, of not trying to um, censor or uh, block access to damaging forms of media because they're just too ubiquitous, but to talk through ways in which they're unrealistic or problematic or perpetuate a harmful myth. Um, but I don't envy that task. I think it's incredibly difficult. So I'd like to do a follow up on both actually Sky's question and, and Kate, your previous point. Uh, so you mentioned at some point you use the word social education, you know, um, and this is particularly interesting from, to me, even in a, in a even broader sense than the context that we're talking about, although it is crucial for the context that we're talking about. That is, we don't really have a system or an approach to do social education, moral education, what it used to be referred to as moral education, of our children. Because on the one hand, we don't want schools to do that, or at least we don't give the tools to schools to do that. Um, and on the other hand, a lot of parents these days don't seem to either either be in a, in a situation, a practical situation of doing that, or they don't seem to have the, you know, the necessary background. I mean, I can imagine, you know, skies on your daughter, to some extent, my daughter, Jamie's uh, sons, yeah, they're going to get an interesting perspective, but that's because they happen to be growing up in, uh, in you know, in a household where there, there's a philosopher who is particularly sensitive to these kind of issues. Um, that's very much the exception to the, to the situation. And so the question that I have in terms of sort of just what your thoughts are in general, again, even outside of the specific realm of of uh, you know women's issues and gender issues because I think that moral education in general is problematic. I mean, look at the kind of situations that we are experiencing, you know, with half of the country going in certain directions that uh, I'm not going to mention because everybody's very well, well aware of it. So it used to be that you know at, in antiquity there was such a thing as moral education. You literally went to uh, learn your grammar, your geometry, and your moral education uh, from you know from uh, uh, a teacher. We don't have that anymore. Um, I don't know that there is any way in which one could reestablish something like that. We don't seem to have it much at home. Uh, you know, the ancient Stoic philosopher Seneca says that we begin our moral education with your family. And that's therefore a family education, moral family education is fundamental because that's how you get your, you know, morals 101. And then you eventually, after you reach the age of reason, uh, when you are essentially a you know young teenager, you begin to think out, uh, on your own. You begin to explore things, uh, you know, uh, sources for your moral education outside of your immediate family. We don't do a lot of that either. So what what's going on, and what should be going on in that department? Yeah, I mean, 
it's obviously tricky to implement on a practical or policy scale, and I, I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, but, you know, I, I can't help think in the current climate um, that anti-racist education would, is crucial. And I think similarly, uh, a, a kind of um, an education in gender biases as well as biases against you know, um, many other groups, the disabled, um, trans people, queer folks, um, so on and so forth. I, I think an moral education that wasn't so much didactic as exposing some of the problems that we face as a society and making people aware um, of these various oppressive, entrenched and intersecting systems. Um, you know, I, I, well, so I'm, for instance, here's what I'm, I, I, here's one suggestion, for instance. So I, I didn't grow up in the United States. I grew up in Italy. And the Italian educational system has certain advantages and certain disadvantages compared to the American one, like, you know, pretty much everything else. However, one of the things that we did do was a significant component in all the way back to elementary school, uh, a significant component of what uh, in the United States is known as civic education. But civic education wasn't just about learning, you know, about the constitution, let's say, or the basic, you know, structure of government, although it was that as well. There was what the kind of thing you're talking about, uh, I, you know, not, spe not specifically in terms of specific content, but in terms of, and here are some general principles by which people live their lives and should live their lives and things like that. We don't have anything like that in the United States that I'm aware of, right? Would you favor a, a reintroduction of that sort of, or an introduction of that sort of civic education early on in a student's uh, studies? I mean, it would depend a lot on the details. There's obviously a, a possibility for it to be um, done badly or abused by um, various forces. Uh, but I mean, this isn't really my area. I don't have kind of concrete suggestions about um, how to implement a moral education program. Yeah, um, actually, that's, you just said something on the lines of, it depends on how it would be implemented, right? So I suspect, for instance, that one of the reasons we do not teach philosophy pre-college pre with very few exceptions in the United States is precisely because a lot of parents have objections to that sort of uh, teaching. Um, which again, it's not necessarily the situation in Europe. I was taught philosophy in high school, for instance, and nobody had ever a problem with, with that sort of stuff. But I have, I have, I, I've talked to people in the United States who do have an objection. I don't know how widespread it is, but they have an objection because they are immediately, of course, aware uh, of the possibility that the, the, the kids are going to be you know, indoctrinated in whatever things that might not like them to be indoctrinated, right? So that's the conundrum that, however, that I'm talking about, that on the one hand, parents, by and large, with some exceptions, don't seem to be uh, either wanting or able to do that sort of job. But at the same time, they don't want schools to do that job either. And so that makes it very difficult to make progress in that in that area. We've got a couple of hands raised that I want to get to. But before we do, I want to take advantage of my privilege here as co-host um, to get my own two cents out there. Um, and, in, and in listening to you talk about this and reflecting on my own thoughts um, about this book, the thing that stood out to me the most and on which I thought much um, rested was this notion of epistemic entitlement. And I suspect, um, and I'd be interested, Kate, in your thoughts about this, I suspect that there's a certain moral entitlement here as well, or let me see if I can rephrase that better, a sense of knowing what counts as good or an entitlement about being a moral knower as opposed to just a knower about empirical facts about the world. So when we talk about things like bigotry, for example, um, to bring it to, to current events within philosophy, there's currently a contentious debate um, about the nature of transphobia in academic philosophy, what counts as transphobia and academic philosophy. And it seems like it might be possible that part of the impasse is who on this side of the debate gets to be positioned as knowing what counts as transphobia. And so in terms of you know, teaching our way past sexism or, or teaching our way in, into feminism, 
that seems to me like the obstacle that we're going to have to overcome is 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 addressing who gets to count as as the moral teacher. Yeah, no, I love that observation. I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, I think as well as a sense of entitlement to be the moral knower, there's also a sense of entitlement to be right, to dominate and um, to kind of get the benefit of the doubt when it comes to who's in the right and who's in the wrong and a kind of guiltlessness that attend, a shamelessness that can attend male privilege. Um, you know, I think that's crucial, but I think there's also a sense of, yeah, entitlement to be the one who dictates the terms of a debate, who weighs in on matters where they're not very expert, um, who dominates a conversation um, even when they're, you know, they should be in the position of the one listening. There, um, there is a tendency to present as the one who is the authority and who has the perspective worth sharing. Um, and I think that's really been an issue in the debate within philosophy about transphobia. We've seen a lot of men who have really no knowledge of feminism, let alone intersectional feminism, weighing in and thinking they have the entitlement to um, make calls about what is legitimate debate versus what I often think is just uh, an incredibly dehumanizing um, way of, uh, of portraying trans people and making them feel that they're not in the room during the discussion, but are rather the object of curiosity and inquiry instead of human beings whose identities should be honored and who should, who have every genuine entitlement to be safe um, in academic spaces, including philosophy. Um, does that make sense that, uh, yeah, there is this, I think there are a lot of people associated with this debate who are uh, men who really don't have an entitlement to be speaking on these topics, um, but they are. Well, let me let me follow up for a second with that, and then I actually want to read a couple of comments or and quest and one comment, one question in the chat, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the people that are patiently lining up for asking you live questions. Uh, and all of this is going to happen in twenty twenty five minutes. Okay, so um, but when I was when I was uh, suggesting, you know, the some kind of of going back to the notion of moral education, of course, I, the implication there is that not everybody can do it. Um, just like we have people who are trained in teaching, you know, math or English or whatever it is, you would have people trained accordingly to uh, to teach that sort of stuff, right? So, uh, so this isn't a question of just allowing anybody that, that that is a teacher to come in and say, "Hey, here is how you should behave," or "Here is how you should, uh, um, you know, you should think about things." But are we? Do we have a so so? Do we have a problem with the very notion of the, uh, that education, that sort of the, that, that the, the moral education is a thing, that, that, that there can be such a thing as, as moral education? Or, or are we having an issue with who is going to do it and, and who is going to uh, essentially control how the thing is going gonna, is gonna to work? Is that a question for yes, me? Yes, that's a question for you. So, so you think that there's such a thing as you know moral expertise? In it's, a sense. I just have to think about it more. That's it's just not what I'm. Yeah, fair enough. It's not what I do. Fair enough. Okay, so Candace in the uh, in the chat says that um, she's a retired assistant superintendent of schools, and they do have moral character education, which focuses primarily on inclusiveness. That's interesting to know. I don't think that's nationwide, obviously, but clearly in that district. So that's interesting. Uh, Susan asks uh, a question, makes a, makes a general point that I, that Kate, you might want to comment on. She says, I think it would be help, it, it would help boys also if they realize they aren't entitled to have sex with women. Is the segregation of our schools therefore hurting us? When schools are integrated, we can learn early on how to get along with others that are different than us. Kavanaugh went, went uh, to an all boys school, for example. In my state of Florida, vouchers to private schools and charter schools are undermining the district-run schools. 
And these Iran schools are required to teach the ramification of things like prejudice, the Holocaust, and African-American history, but those other publicly funded schools are not. What, thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, this is a little bit beyond my, my ken um, and isn't really what the book is about. Um, but uh, I will say one of the inspirations for working on this topic, such as it is, is I actually went to an old boys school the year it integrated and admitted three girls. So three girls uh, to um, several hundred boys. Um, and it was an incredibly misogynistic environment. I didn't at the time have the tools to, and that was going from a co-ed school um, in my final two years of high school. I didn't have the, the tools to kind of name the problem that I was facing, which has been one of my motivations for working on the topic of misogyny. Um, you know, I thought it was me who was um, somehow, um, you know, making all of these mistakes or genuinely um, someone to be despised and ridiculed and belittled in so many different ways. And I didn't have a way to kind of unify the things that were happening to me in the various forms of bullying and derogation and say, these are all down girl moves, um, which in retrospect, I think would have been really helpful. So yeah. in some ways I kind of wrote this book for women and girls in a similar position in a very misogynistic environment, which I think does encompass um, all male or male dominated environments um, and philosophy being one of them um, to, in the hopes that we could make sense of our experiences better collectively and together kind of rally against them. Yep. So yeah, I'm not a fan of single sex education especially when it comes to all boys schools. That being said, you know, this was what, you know, uh, 20 years ago in Australia. So this is just one, one anecdote, um, but right. it was an unhealthy environment for everyone, uh, especially the girls who entered into, into, into it like me. Okay, I'm gonna call on the first uh, viewer on list, uh, which uh, was uh, Vitor. Vitor, you can unmute um, yourself and ask your question. Maybe. <laughs> I don't. Oh yes, there you are. Hi. Uh, sorry. Sorry for um, for, for this. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Vitor. I'm uh, living in Mexico. And I come from a biological science background, so apologies for any English in my language. Uh, uh, I, uh, my concern is uh, that um, if we have a um, uh, institu institutionalized uh, way of doing things so patriarchal, um, how good would that be to actually do these things about education in institutions? If we don't uh, radically change the system, uh, the way of thinking, you know, the apriori uh, structure, so that uh, we can actually, you know, uh, make things better rather than worse. Because do, do you think that there is a risk that if you just get uh, education, will make things worse because we live in a patriarchal society? Really sorry, I, I couldn't hear that properly. Yeah, it's, it's I'm hard sorry. To hear. Um, um, it was hard to hear, but I think that the question was about, uh, you know, the, the risk of uh, if we institutionalize sort of, sort of moral teaching and things like that, then there is a risk of ideological, uh, you know, somebody exploiting it for ideological reasons that are not the ones that are intended. That's pretty much the, the sure. I think that was the gist, right? Um, actually, in that in that sense, however, I think this is uh, this is a problem that is broader than uh, again the kind of moral education that we're talking about. Because, you know, for instance, I was in Tennessee for a number of years, and I was at the college level. I was teaching evolution, and there was a lot of uh, push to uh, at the pre-college level, especially to teach you know give equal time to the, to the teaching of creationism. And I, I met plenty of people who were very afraid, very very concerned that their 
kids were going to be exposed to the lie of evolution and, and likely going to hell. So I can see that, you know, from my perspective, that was like bizarre as an evolutionary biologist. But at the same time, I could I could see that these parents were actually seriously concerned uh, from their point of view. This this was not going to be a good thing. And, you know, it's it's hard. It, it really is hard to convince people that uh, that uh, exposing their kids to certain ideas that their parents might not agree with is actually a good thing for the kids. And it, it creates it creates obvious conflicts uh, there um, that are not that easy to handle, I think. OK, unless uh, Jamie or Kate have a comment on that, we're going to go to Leslie. Leslie, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thanks for Hi. having me here. And um, thanks so much for writing the book, Kate. I think I want to explore a little bit different of an audience, because I read through the book as well without a lot of hope. And uh, I'm a data scientist by training, so forgive me on my lay philosophy here. But you know, the, the idea that Seneca has about with, with when there is no hope, there is no fear. And mm -hmm. at this point in my life, it was your last chapter that it was actually striking because my kids are grown. You know, I'm like, what does it matter now? What, if I have no fear, what does this look like to try to change things? Mm -hmm. And I think that might've been what Vitor was talking about as well, you know, kind of the institutions addressing that institutional part. And what does that look like in your mind, Kate, not if you can, maybe for a different angle, not from looking down or to the younger generation, but to looking at, you know, the older or middle aged generation, what does it look like um, for, for making changes? Yeah, no, I love that observation. I mean, I was thinking too when Massimo spoke earlier about the um, the idea that you know philosophers shouldn't just uh, describe or analyze the world. The point is to change it. I, I was thinking of the James Baldwin line that um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed without being faced, um, and that's really the point of my work. That um, it's not clear what we can change uh, yet. And that's in a way a question more for, for people with a policy bent than me who can um, come up with structural solutions to these very structural problems. Um, but I think we need to face the problems in, in great detail before we can change them. Um, but yeah, I wonder, I mean, part of what uh, your question reminded me of was the kind of courage we saw evinced by Tirana Burke's Me Too movement and ways in which, um, you know, what if we stop being afraid of holding white men accountable for their misdeeds? Um, now, I, I hasten to say that's not necessarily um, to, um, you know, endorse carceral solutions, which I think are highly problematic, especially in this country. It's not to, um, you know, advocate a specific set of responses. Um, in terms of the law, but morally speaking, what if we stopped letting white men get away with rape and murder? I mean, what would that look like? What if we stopped being afraid of their reactions? What if we simply stopped being afraid in ordinary discourse of white men's disapproval or consternation or their feeling ashamed of bad behavior? Um, you know, I, another kind of very, um, small point that I thought might be helpful to make here, and this is um, partly in response to something Sky brought up and also Jamie. Um, you know, I think we would come a long way socially if we could um, lean into shame and in a way not think of shame as something, I mean, yes, it feels aversive. Yes, it's an aversive emotion, but it's something to be learned from and embraced and not a kind of huge loss of face which is itself connected with feeling entitled to keep face to save face um so what would it be like um i wonder if um you know we encouraged and in fact insisted that white men who feel ashamed of something they did or said or even thought um if we we presented that as an opportunity to learn and not something to run away from, but something that everyone who's privileged, certainly including me, will screw up and will have to, um, you know, if we face it, if we face our mistakes, 
will have to feel a moment of shame and then, you know, move from um, a position of having our head bowed in shame to lifting our head up and trying to work out how to move forward in a better way, morally speaking. Um, you know, but I have discussed in um, various places the phenomenon of entitled shame that instead of doing that uh, becomes incredibly destructive both to others and the self. And so that's part of what we need to get past is a shame that seeks to destroy the eyes of the world, um, as Eric Erickson put it, um, rather than um, trying to, um, if you like, regain eye contact, the ability to hold eye contact with the people you wronged or uh, misunderstood. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that helps. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so in the chat, there is a clarification about uh, what uh, Vitter was trying to ask. Uh, Nathan says, what I heard was if patriarchy is institutionalized, don't we need to completely change institutions and not work from the inside? And apparently Vitter agrees that that's part of what he was trying to say. What do you think, uh, Kate? I mean, I think it depends on the institution. Um, I don't think there's any wholesale um, answer that I would advocate to that. Um, it's partly a matter of experiments in living. You know, can we, for example, have genuinely egalitarian marriages that are heterosexual? Um, I think we can, I think I'm in one. Um, but I am also, I understand people who are on the other side of that and think the whole, um, the whole institution of marriage should just be abolished. Um, and that, you know, included many people in the queer community who didn't necessarily want same-sex marriage, they wanted the whole institution to be dismantled, um, partly because of its patriarchal as well as homophobic roots. So I think it's a matter of both experimentation and also um, the specific institution and whether it works, whether we can work out ways of reforming from the inside or whether that's simply impossible given the inherent structures we're dealing with. But good, that's great. Thanks for clarifying that question. And I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear it. No, that's before. okay. It was it was difficult to hear. Um, in terms of uh, you know, demol do away with with the institution of marriage, you actually find you might find unlikely political allies there. For instance, libertarians typically tend to question the whole thing right. on the base on a very completely different basis, right? On the on the notion that it's not it's not the state's business uh, to sort of recognize in some sense what people's relationships are people are do what they do and that's their business not the state's business and even though i'm not a libertarian and even though i'm the i'm, I'm, I'm married i actually see the the point of, of that kind of approach that would actually solve a number of problems um don't think it's going to happen anytime soon but i think it's uh, it's kind of interesting uh perspective yeah i do worry about um not having adequate protections particularly for uh, women who are rendered economically vulnerable due to patriarchal structures, um, a contract can actually be very helpful in protecting people from destitution. Um, right. So, you know, yeah. innovations like no fault divorce and alimony and so on um, have, I think, been crucial to protect uh, women, um, uh, although men sometimes need the same protections too if they're the economically more vulnerable partner which is um, increasingly the case so i'm just noticing that we are almost up with the hour which is really disappointing because i have so many questions um or you know things i'd like to say myself but we have two more hands raised and i want to make sure that we're able to include them with the time that mm -hmm. we have rather than monopolize you all for myself um so Kate, if if you're if you could unmute yourself, if you'd like to ask Kate your question. Um, I I let's see. I don't know. Possible for Kate to unmute herself. There we go. There we go. I wasn't able to unmute, but now I am. Can yeah. you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I I just. I've read both of your books and um, in many ways they've been life changing for me because not because I was unaware, but because they give the solid arguments underneath. Um, and I think they are extraordinary because 
um, they're sort of uh, Bibles against gaslighting um, when it comes to uh, patriarchy and how misogyny plays out. Because a as a woman, the, the thing that's most pernicious is having, um, having to deal with the crazy making of being in a situation where you can feel you can feel anger and rage and resentment um, uh, coming at you, but but you either can't find the words because you're dealing with the emotions of what it is to be on the receiving end of that, or because everyone else around you, including women, are saying, oh, that's not what happened. It's not that big of a deal. You're just imagining it. He didn't mean it. And um, I think speaking to before the the issue about pessimism, um, it's, it's right to be pessimistic about this. It's everywhere and it's awful. And I think if you're not pessimistic, pessimistic about it, you're not seeing it clearly. <laughs> totally. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit more about um, the entitled shame that you just mentioned, because I haven't I, I circled and highlighted and scribbled all over that part in Down Girl about when you finally get to the end and say, I think this is largely about shame. But I didn't see that a lot um, in Entitled. Um, could you speak more on that a little bit? Yeah, totally. Um, no, I, I... Oh. oh, you went mute. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I was muted, I think. There um, you go. Okay, now you're, you're good. Uh, um, so... Yeah, I love those observations because, I mean, in a way I thought of the point of these books as being a bulwark against gaslighting. Um, you know, we're told so often as part of these patriarchal norms and expectations to keep the peace, to play nice, to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, um, instead of seeing um, what's systemic about the ways girls and women are faced with, you know, just, endless entrenched um, gendered expectations and norms that are highly oppressive. Um, and, you know, we're, we're put down, we're belittled, we're sexualized, we're desexualized, you know, we're called, um, you know, every, imagine a hierarchy and name a hierarchy and women are put down with respect to it, um, you know, aesthetically, epistemically, morally, um, it, it just, you know, it, it's a lot. Um, so to try to unify these phenomena and say, it's not you, it's the patriarchy um, is, you know, part of the point here, especially when people are telling you, no, that's just paranoia. That's just, um, you know, it's, it's you. Um, and in terms of the entitled shame, I, I talk about it most in the section of Down Girl on family annihilators who are generally men who, um, have lost something, um, often they've gone bankrupt or they've lost their marriage, their children. And these are men who um, react not by, you know, feeling shame and moving on, but by these incredibly destructive rampages where they kill their spouse or ex-spouse and children in these really shocking events that nevertheless take place at least once a week on average in America. Um, so entitled shame I think of as this highly destructive toxic force. I think shame can be morally productive and fitting emotion, but entitled shame that feels not like it has to bow your head and not meet with someone's eyes for a moment but rather that you want to destroy the other person's eyes because they're looking at you and making you feel small or inadequate. That's what I think entitled shame is all about. Thank you. We, we have a few more minutes. Should we go on, on Susan? I th yeah, let's get her in. Okay. Um, I, I, I may be misunderstanding. So this, this question may be off, but the way I'm hearing it is, is that it would help men if they were shamed. So the first step of that is to speak up. So is it important to speak up even if you don't do it well? 
it would it be worse to speak to do it poorly than just to be quiet like in jamie's example when she thought the man was mansplaining should somebody have said hey dude do you notice that you're mansplaining to a neuroscientist when i mean is that a type of shame that you're talking about i tend to get angry so sometimes i think just be quiet susan you're going to make it worse by getting angry because you know women are always accused of being emotional and everything so i is it better to be quiet or better to speak up even if you do it badly? That's my question. Yeah, you know, I think that not so much as what's better, but what you're entitled or permitted to do. So I think, you know, when there's an incident like that, um, someone is perfectly entitled um, to call it out. Um, on the other hand, I'm reluctant to say you're obligated to do that because there can be real consequences, including violence. Um, you know, maybe not in that exact situation, but in many situations, there can be violent consequences. Um, there can be really terrible social fallout. And so to say to someone who's um, vulnerable, no, you're obligated to call it out. I think that would be, um, that would be really wrong headed. I think it's something where, you know, if you can, and it's the right, um, Thing for you to do to vent frustration and you feel safe and secure it can be a good thing to do but I think I'm I'm wary of general moral obligations on this score because um yeah it can just be too hard and the stakes can be too high um, for many uh, vulnerably positioned people so I think it's not on those who are more vulnerable in a situation to solve it um, and yeah, I completely agree with the comment I just saw pop up. Other men should have a huge role in calling it out, especially when they're uh, privileged in various ways and so less vulnerable in the situation. Um, and pot potentially sometimes too, for uh, all the wrong reasons, they can have more influence as an authority figure, even though that shouldn't be the case. Um, it can be the case socially, giving them um, a good uh, amount of leverage in the situation. Um, but yeah, I think I, I want to say really depends on the circumstances and I, I encourage people to think of themselves as entitled but not obligated to call others out for these kinds of, um, these kinds of misdeeds. So there's one comment that I'd like to add there uh, from a very different kind of experience that I've have over, have had over decades, uh, and that is the difference between moral obligations or at least uh you know the, the moral aspect of the of, of the issue and the sort of the psychological effectiveness of certain responses and the completely different context there is i've had an interest and an involvement as a public speaker and writer in the issue of science and pseudoscience i mentioned earlier on the you know creationists and evolutionary biology but in general pseudoscience uh and has been a major interest in mine, both professionally and in terms of outreach. And pretty early on, I had to face the fact that although there are certain things that are right to do and right to call out, you know, you cannot allow, for instance, uh, you know, clear pseudoscience to be taught in, uh, in uh, high school. I think that actually is morally wrong. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I also started uh, started looking at the psychological literature about what actually works, because there is a psychological literature in terms of persuasion and how to, to approach uh, people either one on one or on a public stage and so on and so forth. And the psychology, the psychological literature, I think, would be something that we 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 would we should all look into it no matter what the specific issue is, because if the goal is to actually persuade people to actually change things, uh, then having in mind, having clear in mind what the right thing is, it's not enough. You also want to have a path, uh, you know, that is a practical path to how to get there. And, and there is, there is an, a certain amount of literature there in psychology that, that can help. So um, that's another way of looking at, um, at the issue. Jamie, as you pointed out, we are beyond time. Do you have one more question or parting comment before uh, we wrap it up? Yeah. yeah. So just as you know, we're talking about mansplaining. One thing that I've recently learned to, to say that I found helpful um, when I'm feeling confident, which is not all of the time, 
Um, but I will straight up ask someone what reason they have to think I don't know what they're telling me. Um, you know, recently, um, for example, I was mentioning that I was writing something on Albert Camus, which is, you know, a lot of what I do these days. Um, and, you know, 100% chance if you tell a dude that you're working on Albert Camus, he will ask you if you have read The Stranger. Um, and so, you know, without missing a beat, my response is what what would make you think I had I had not done that. Um, and I would that like sort of to point out to you that it's not 100% because <laughs> this person did not ask you if you read. <laughs> but yes, you're, you're right. That's pretty cool. Well, so I was I was using the term dude in a very precise um, way. Right. I will provide you my definition of dude later. Um, mm -hmm. But it sort of seems to shift the conversation instead of making them automatically defensive by accusing them of something, you put them in position of having to answer a question and sort of evaluate their own reasons. And it turns out they very often, you know, don't have good ones. Um, and that's a good way of, of helping them to become aware of that. Obviously, you know, that's not going to be the right solution in all scenarios. Um, sometimes people will get angry no matter what you say or, or do. Um, but I found that to be the best way to neutralize a mansplainer. I love that. That's such a good response. Um, you know, I think there's also... Uh, there's something to be said, and this again doesn't always work, but for going silent and making it clear that you're not a kind of willing um, and sympathetic audience for what's being mansplained to you. Um, that, you know, in some cases, mansplaining isn't about something you already know, it's about something that you're not interested in learning or discussing that's really off topic, that um, is kind of wasting time that could be you know used more fruitfully and I think it's helpful there sometimes um, to just have no response to kind of decline to provide uh, a willing friendly audience for the relentless mansplaining of things that really aren't apropos. All right thank you this is we're now beyond officially beyond time um, so well, I <laughs> yes go ahead. Go thank ahead. you all so much for coming it's been a pleasure. Oh. Thank you for, for coming. This was a, a lot of fun. It was interesting. And hopefully it was, uh, you know, it will give food for thought to people. So we just had a lovely conversation for an hour with Kate Mann, who is author of Entitled, How Male Privilege Hurts Women. And uh, thanks, Jamie, for participating as usual and for helping Thank out with you. the whole thing. This was a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, let me just remind everybody that the next edition of the Philosophy Book Club will take place on Sunday, February 28th, Jamie and I, at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Jamie and I would have a discussion about grandstanding, the use and abuse of moral talk by Justin Tozzi and Brendan Wormke. Until then, stay safe.